We are in a, a series here at Oak Hills Church uh, and nearing the end of it, as, uh, and it's called Generous with the Good News. And each week we have been hearing from uh, Oak Hills Church members uh, who have uh, been so generous to this church and so generous in their lives. And, but we've also, they've had to work things out and work out how generous, what is God calling us to? And we've been hearing their stories and their perspective. And so uh, Jeremy and Claire Wheeler are coming now uh, to, to share with us some of their thoughts on generosity. Jeremy and Claire have been a part of Oak Hills Church for uh, quite some time. They have three little kids, um, and, uh, and so their lives are full. And, uh, and, and, but very good, of course, um, uh, Toby and, and Gabby are great friends with my daughter, and she loves talking about them. I hear stories about them all the time, and, uh, you know, all good, but who knows what trouble they're getting into right now. And <laughs> Only some of that's true, though, yeah, right. those stories. Right, it's all true, but uh, Jeremy and Claire, you guys are so generous, and, uh, but I want to know, what are you learning? What is God teaching you guys about generosity, and how is God challenging you in this way of generosity? For sure. Yeah, when it comes to generosity, I struggle with this idea of faith versus stewardship. I like the idea of stewardship. I can take what God's given me. I can plan how it's divided. It's logical. It's intentional. That's, that's comfortable for me. And then you have God doing, he has an idea of, of what you should do, and he, he says, try this. And you're like, that doesn't make sense, God. That, that's kind of silly. And sometimes it even feels stupid. You're like, no, I don't want to do that. But, but you have this conflict of faith and stewardship and, and when should I do what makes sense? When should I do what's wise would be another word versus when should I do something that isn't making sense, that doesn't, you don't want to do and it, it, it seems kind of weird and really he wants us to trust that I can hear him correctly and it's, it's kind of a whole other step of faith there for me. But I feel stuck between this pendulum swinging of faith and stewardship and if you look at my life, B.C., that's before Claire, <laughs> okay, and her life before me, like, we were both good at this idea of, of generosity. We were generous with our time and our money, and it was easy, because giving only affected me. And then after I got married, and then after we had kids, that changed. The, the giving I do affects my family, and, and that's harder. And I, I found myself starting to fall for this idea of scarcity, that things were limited. And... Um, I naturally wanted to move there, but if I'm not careful, I start to believe that when I'm giving, especially on that faith side of the pendulum, that giving will affect the opportunities my kids may have someday. And that was hard. That, that's really hard for me. But I, I really, I'm trying to realize, I'm, I'm learning that God's economy is not scarce. He wants us to live abundantly. He wants to give to us abundantly. And, and it's not like if you love your one child, you're taking love from another. You know, that's, that's God's economy, this economy of love. And I, th I think that applies also to our time in some sense and our money. Uh, so God has abundance and he wants us to live abundantly is, is what I'm being challenged with. That's good. And um, when you realize that you were kind of a conduit of God's blessing, what did that feel? What's that like for you guys? Really how, just what our verse talked about is just Paul thanking them. Hey, people thank God when you're so generous. What's that like for you guys? Um, so, good question. Let me open my notes. Um, so, I think one thing that I'm learning um, along those lines is how to receive God's blessings for me. Um, and Jeremy talked a little bit about uh, the scarcity mindset and feeling like there's not enough to go around. Um, and I have a story about chicken nuggets. Um, so, Excellent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm one of five kids. So when we were growing up, there was seven of us at the table. Um, and so naturally, when we were eating chicken nuggets for dinner, um, we would count the chicken nuggets, and each plate got exactly four chicken nuggets. And if anybody dared take five, that meant that somebody else would only get three. Um, and so I think that thought or that mindset uh, started to creep into other areas of my life and other, um, yeah, like other, other parts of what I believe to be true. Um, but um, I've been learning 
So Matthew 7 talks about God, the Father, and as a good father, he gives good gifts. Um, and I think I knew that in my head and was like, oh, yeah, God gives good gifts, you know, and I would spend time telling other people, like, oh, God gives good gifts. And, good. you know, I would even say, oh, in John 10, like, Jesus says, um, I have come to bring you life abundantly. And I would encourage people, like, don't settle for, you know, something not abundant. Like, Jesus came to give us good things. Um, but I had a really hard time receiving that for myself. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, a lot of, I don't know, it was just like a, like a guilty feeling. Like, I would get to the store and be like, oh, look at that cute thing. Like, that would be really nice to have. But then it would feel guilty. Like, if I bought that for myself, like, that money couldn't go submissions or to my friend who needed something and um, instead of realizing and understanding like God has more like that this ten dollars is not going to matter to this other person um, anyway it felt that way to me so uh, okay so um, Psalm 34 Uh, let's see, starting in verse 8. It says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his godly people, for those who fear him will have all that they need. Even strong young lions sometimes go hungry, but those who trust in the Lord will lack no good thing. Um, so, um, so, yeah, I have... I'm learning to really receive that God is good, that he has good things for me. Um, and that's not just, you know, a $10 piece of jewelry, but it's also that relationship, that abundant relationship that I have with him um, and that there's enough for everybody. So. As we've been saying every week, and Jeremy and Claire really highlighted it this week, God gave everything to be in relationship with us, gave it all. And in response to that generosity, in response to that, we are generous. Uh, let's uh, thank Jeremy and Claire now. We'll have Olivia Puccini come and share with us this morning on worship as generosity. Good morning, Oak Hills Church. It's great to be with you today. I want to start by saying thank you for being such a generous community towards me and my family over the last two years, or actually the last 20 years. Maybe you do not know this, but for 20 years, this church has supported us monthly as a family so that we could serve overseas and missions. So thank you for those who give so generously towards missions. Then we came and lived in your missions home for about six months. What a generous place. I've never lived in a house that big. It made me uncomfortable after living in these little apartments in the former Soviet Union. But you went all out. You went generous with allowing missionaries and other pastors in need to stay in that home. And then you've been generous to me over the last year and a half when I've been the interim worship pastor before the wonderful Taylor took the position. So I want to say thank you. We are speaking about generosity, and you are a church that is generous. Today I get the assignment from Pastor Rod as he is away of speaking about generosity as worship. Let's start with the Word of God, a passage I'll use today for my sermon. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly. And she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can go do good for them, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Here we are over 2,000 years later, and what Jesus said is true. We're telling her story. 
So we look at this story and we wonder just how generous was she being? The people around said, oh, what a waste. That was such an expensive ointment that you've just put on the feet of Jesus. So I did a little research. It says clearly in the passage that the ointment or the perfume was worth 300 denarii. And if you looked at what one denarii was worth in her time, one denarii was a day laborer's wage. An average worker who got out there with their hands would be paid one denarii for a hard full day of work. So you take away the Sabbaths that they were required to rest and the holidays, the time off. We probably, as people, work about 300 of 365 days a year. So she spilled on the feet of Jesus something that was worth 300 denarii, or a full year's worth of wages. So if we transfer that to 2023, does anybody know what the average American earns across the entire United States in 2023? It is $59,000. So this woman took the equivalent of $59,000 worth of an ointment and without any hesitation broke it open and poured it on the feet of Jesus. But let's make this a bit more personal. I want you to get in your mind right now the number that you put on your taxes every year. You get a W-2 that says what your personal yearly wages are. Now imagine taking a whole year, that number, in your mind, and giving it away to God in one moment of worship. This is what this woman did. And so you can understand the people who stood by why they were wondering. They were like, what is this woman doing? Can't she see the lepers laying outside? Can't she see the widows who need food? Why would she spend a whole year's worth of wages, your whole year's worth of wages, and pour it on the feet of Jesus? As Jeremy said, it makes no sense. It's not the wise thing to do. But she did it. Why did she do it? It was an act of pure worship. And here's what we need to know. Why was Jesus okay that she did it? He saw the poor people. We know that he loves people like no one else. Why was he okay for such a generous, wasteful act of worship? He had no problem with it. Why? Because, as Claire said, God does not need your money, and he's not running out of money. Jesus wasn't scared that those people would not be taken care of in his kingdom. Maybe some of you could sit back and think, wow, four weeks of generosity sermons. This church must really need my money. There's something going on here. There's a project that needs to be done. And I want to address that right now. Although this church is 100% dependent on the generosity of the community of people here, we do not need your money. God does not need you to give a full year's wages. He owns everything. And if you choose not to give, we as a church know that God is our ultimate provider and he will provide what is needed. So Jesus wasn't concerned about the money. He was concerned about her heart. And that's why we speak about generosity. It's not about your money. It's about your heart. And the issue is, is that money flows to what we love. And so what God asks you is, do you love me? Do you worship me? That is the question. There are many times I can remember being generous, and if you think about the times that you think you know you've been generous, I know every single person in this room has been generous at one point in their time, in their life. When I was growing up, I went to kids' church, similar to what you have here, and we had this game where whoever brought the most as an offering, boys or girls, won for that week. And there were even balloons involved and popping them. If the girls won, the boys' balloon was popped. It was this big ordeal. And so I remember for my birthday when I was 10 years old, somebody, a grandparent or something, gave me $15. And you know, this is already 1988, so $15 was a bit more than it is now. And I remember going in thinking, I'm going to be generous, and I'm going to win that offering for the girls in kids' church. And I remember feeling so proud, and we won, and their balloon was popped. And I can just remember all the girls around me clapping and cheering on. I had won through my generosity. And sometimes, even today, we like to win with our generosity. Maybe you come from a family that didn't have much, but you've done good. 
and you come out and you think, my family couldn't do this, but I'm going to do this. I won in life. I am generous. I can think of a time where I've given to the poor, as many of you have. But if I look at my heart, did I give out of a generous spirit that I saw them as an invaluable child of God, and my generosity was flowing because of their value to God? Or was it because I thought it was the right thing to do? Or was it because I thought God's watching and he's going to know if I'm generous to the poor or not? I was living on this scale. I've also given generosity as trust in God. I wish it were more often. I remember in college, I had saved up money. My parents couldn't give me anything for college. And so I had worked so hard to get perfect scores, perfect grades, so that I could go to college debt-free. And I had saved up this money. But my roommate, after my freshman year, at Christmas, she called me and she said, I don't have enough money to come back, Olivia. I'm sorry, you're going to be rooming alone. And so I emptied out my checking account and paid her tuition because I felt like God told me to. I remember my parents going, you are not so, Olivia. We've seen you work. This isn't the wise thing to do. And I gave it. And the very next week, a bank called my parents and said, we have so much scholarship money, we don't know what to do, and we're wondering if your daughter could use more. And it was the exact amount I'd given to my friend. I've had those experiences of trust. Generosity as worship, this is harder. Because we can't have any other motives in than a pure love of God. She could have used her money for many other things because I'm sure she loved other things. It's not that she only loved Jesus. She probably had a family she loved. She probably had a neighbor that had a difficult thing that she could have given to. There are many things she could have given to, but when it came down to it, when she saw Jesus, he was the love of her life, and she gave it all. It was pure worship. The issue is, whether you believe it or not, that every single human being is created to worship. And so if we don't worship God, we find something to worship. We find something to love because it's made in the DNA of what we were created to do by God himself. And so if we don't worship God, we're going to worship something. And whatever that something is, if you look at your life, generosity flows to it. No problem at all. Money flows to what we love, to what we worship, no problem at all. For example, my son Oliver here is in the row. He's getting ready to leave in the middle of this service to return to Notre Dame. He's a freshman. He's been back for fall break. I have never loved football in my life. I'm sorry, you Minnesotans. I even grew up in Kansas City, Missouri, right next to the Kansas City Chiefs. You know, they're doing pretty well. Mahomes and all of them, Travis Kelsey. I don't watch it. I grew, you know, I went to North Central University a few blocks from the Metrodome. I never went to a Vikings game. My husband every Sunday watches football. I'm off in another room. Never got into it. But my son goes to Notre Dame. And because I love him, I'm on that TV every single time they play. I'm cheering them on. I'm buying the gear. I'm sending him the sweatshirts. I'm doing everything. And I'm looking for my son in the audience. My generosity suddenly flows. My attention flows because I love him. My daughter has started to love theater. And my kids know I keep a budget app on my phone. I have a budget for eating out. I'll tell them, you know, nope, the budget's met. We're not going to eat out. That's too expensive. You know, all those sort of things. But as soon as I found out that she loves theater as I love theater, this Christmas season I bought Guthrie tickets to go see A Christmas Carol. Right? Generosity flows easily because I love them so much. Where does your generosity flow easily to? Pay attention, think about that for a moment. It's a joy because you love it so much. Of course this woman had other things she loved, no doubt, but Jesus had her heart and generosity flowed to him because of that. So I realize we look at this woman, and it's actually kind of a crushing story. Because I don't know about you, but it'd be hard for me to give a year's worth of my salary in one moment of worship to Jesus. That sounds like a crushing, impossible place to get. And even though I'm a pastor, I'm not above the reality that that is a big ask, and it seems like an impossible ask. So I wouldn't be doing my job here as a minister to just say, 
This is the goal, people. Go do it. Because it seems like an impossible goal to worship and love to where we freely and joyfully pour out our most precious things to God. But the good news is, is that we can train. We can train so that sort of worship, so that sort of generosity becomes like muscle memory in our bones. Just like Karate Kid, he trained, you know, wax on, wax off, paint up, paint down, and he was able, muscle memory, it just started to happen. And I think sometimes in the church we're waiting for some empowerment miracle that suddenly our heart changes, and those times do happen, but we can also train, like everything else in life, step by step, little by little, to create the heart that we know we want, to create who we're meant to be. Sometimes I feel myself floundering, I deal with a lot of things, depression, etc. And then I come to this moment where I come to God and I say, God, who am I meant to be? And I get a vision of who I'm meant to be. And it's like, I, all I can imagine, it's like I become a strong, a strong tree. I just go, Phew! you know, it's like I, I suddenly step into who I am. Depression is not me. This is who I am. And you know who you are meant to be. And it is normal to struggle with stepping into who you're meant to be. But you can train for it. You can practice it. And you will become that person. We can train for worship. The first step I want to give you for training for worship is you can train with gratitude that everything you have is a gift. And maybe as soon as I said that, some of you just clicked off your mind and thought, oh no, there's books about that. Keep a gratitude journal. I know, I know, I know. But I'm not saying that. Gratitude is the answer for everything. Whether you want to dismiss it because there's a book on it. You go ask a therapist. I've asked my therapist. Gratitude is the answer to everything. You can be going through cancer, and if you can have a spirit of gratitude, you will stand strong. You can be going through divorce, you can go through financial ruin, and if you can find a way to find how God is present and with you, then you can stand strong. It's not just an exercise for pansies who like to get journals out with their coffee. It is a life-changing practice that trains you for worship. So you must drill into your bones that every single thing you have is a gift. And some of us, especially in America, we're taught, I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps, right? This is what we're taught, and we believe it, that we worked hard, that we went and got the, the degrees, that we got in the best colleges, that we took our talents, and we worked so hard, that we did the internships, that we networked, that we are where we're at today, that we have the salary and the home and the things we have today because we worked hard. And so that's why it's difficult for us to sometimes think, everything I have is a gift from God. But I want to challenge your thinking a little bit on this, on the bootstraps mentality. Yes, hard work matters. God wants you to do the very best. There's all these stories about doing the best with everything you have, the talents you have. There's no doubt that God honors hard work. But I've seen people work hard. I've lived in Armenia, one of the poorest nations in the world. I remember driving in the plateaus in northern Armenia, these isolated villages with no running water, no schools, no hospitals. I remember seeing a woman about 65 as I'm driving by, walking through an open field. She had walked to the nearest wells. And on her back, she had this big stick, and on each side of the stick was a bucket full of water. And she was bent over, old, walking through the fields just to get water home, to do dishes, to cook and boil some potatoes, to give liquid to her children, her grandchildren. Did that woman work hard every single day of her life? Yes. Does she have talents? Yes. Did she have the opportunity to apply for Notre Dame, University of Minnesota? Absolutely not. Does she live in a land where she's prejudiced against because of her language, because of her status? That she would have never been given an opportunity to even go to high school? Absolutely. So what's the difference between that woman who works hard every single day of her life and you that works hard here? The difference is she was born on the plateaus of Armenia. You were born in the United States 
in the 21st or 20th century, and everything you have, all the opportunities you have, are a gift from God. And when you realize that this gift is from God, then you start to have gratitude, and you're able to worship him. Number two, you train by asking God to help you understand who you are and who God is. This is key. We must understand who we are and who he is, the reality. In this series, we have the title, Generous with the Good News. Good news is a more colloquial way of saying the old-fashioned word gospel, generous with the gospel. And what is the gospel? I found this definition by Timothy Keller, a well-known pastor who recently passed away, but a well-known scholar as well. And he wrote this as his definition. The definition of the gospel is that we are far more in need of God than we ever dare to believe, yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dare hope. Do you realize your great need for God? in your life. I remember there was a point in my life, because I grew up in the church, my dad was a hippie rock musician, so he had a crazy life, but he made sure I had the straight and narrow and good church life after he found Christ. You know, I got married, I was pure, I, you know, I've never done anything that bad, I studied for ministry, I've spent my whole life overseas giving myself in missions, and I remember probably about 10 years ago, I remember thinking, you know, my whole life people have said, if, you're the, if you were the only one on the earth, Jesus would have come and died for you. And I remember thinking, really? For me? I haven't done anything that bad. <laughs> that was my response. Jesus would have to die for me because I gossiped a few times or I told a few white lies? Really? And at that moment, I felt like God took his hands off for a moment and said, really? You think that you're all that. Let me remove my hands from you for a bit and you will see the true nature of who you are. And I went into a few years where I saw things in myself I never knew were possible, but they absolutely brought me to a point where I recognized my intense need for God. Have you gotten to that point where you have reached your end? You know, I said I've been, you know, battling depression. I come to points where I reach my end. And all I can do is imagine myself in the lap of a loving God and say, God, help me. If you haven't reached the end of who you are and your own abilities and your own perfection, your own hard work, I promise you someday you will. Whether it be a disease or a relationship that falls apart or finances or ultimately in death, you will come to a point where you recognize and a tremendous need for the God of the universe, the master of the stars, to step in and help you. And the sooner you realize that, the better your life will be. So not only do you have to realize your need for God, but you also have to realize that you're more loved and accepted than you ever dared dream imagine. Grace is not given to you based on how you perform or what you do. Even in those years when I felt like I was making wrong choices, that did not change one inch the love of God towards me. And when you realize that you are anchored in a love that will never leave you, that is willing to do anything for you, and when you realize your need for it, then you begin to worship. Then you raise your hands and you say, I surrender because I need you so much, and the only place that's home, the only place that's safe, is with you and your love. So we must realize who we are and how loved we are by him and who he is. And once you realize that, you dote on God. You're generous with God. When he asks you to do something, you move and you do it joyfully because you know who he is and you can trust him. We can uh, also look at a different version of the story. Luke, who... um, was known, he wrote one of the books of the Bible entitled Luke. He was a doctor, so he was known to be very methodical, and he would interview people, and he would get all the details. And so his book is known to give more details in the stories than the other books. So let's look at Luke's version of this very same story that I started this message with today. You're going to see it on the screen. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. 
And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet and her tears, and wiped them with the hair of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. And now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who's touching him, for she's a sinner." And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, The one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, You've judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. And you did not anoint my head with oil, but she's anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So now we see she was a woman in desperate need of God, and she worshiped. Finally, you can train for worship by daily turning towards Jesus. You can be in this church. You can be baptized. You could have prayed what we call the sinner's prayer or salvation prayer, and yet... As you're here, you can be turned away from the cross. There can be people on the outside who have not been baptized, who have not yet prayed to accept Jesus, and yet they can be turned toward the cross. And so I ask you to examine your life. Which way are you turning? And if you find that you've strayed, it's okay. We serve a generous God. You can start to turn daily to Jesus. You can look towards the cross every single day you can realize that not only did Jesus only have a robe that was taken from him as he was crucified, but he gave everything he had, no bank account, he gave his life so that you and I could have it. And when we turn towards Jesus, we see that. Some ways you can do that practically. I want to challenge you to live over the next few months by reading over and over again the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Live with Jesus, learn him, see what he says, how he reacts, how he loves people. Be able to quote him because you know him so well. That will start an attitude of worship. Find a place to listen to God. So often we're so busy talking to God, I want to ask you to be silent and listen to Jesus. And then finally, practice worship. And for me, Of course, I love to sing. You know, my Grandpa Roger, that guy couldn't sing worth anything. I remember, you know, standing next to him in church, he'd be singing off key, and he'd be tapping his foot, and he'd be worshiping. It's not about your musical ability. In the car, in the shower, start to play worship songs and see how you change. Singing has been proven to retrain and change the neural pathways of your brain. That's why we use it. So start a habit. Start to train for worship. And then you can do what this woman did and use your generosity as an agent of grace. She prepared Jesus to die on the cross with her life's, with her year's worth of wages. You use your generosity so that people are healed physically, so they're healed spiritually, and so that God is worshiped in Egan, in the Twin Cities, in Minnesota, and in the world. Let's pray. God, thank you for everything that you've done for us. I stand with many people here and say, I could not have done what this woman did. Generosity, so unimaginable and so worshipful. So God, take each one of us exactly where we're at. Many of us here, we believe in you. We believe you're good. And yet we're still not at this point. So God, help us. Help us to see you at work around us. Help us to have a spirit of gratitude. 
Help us to turn towards the cross. Help us to learn Jesus. And help us to worship you. For that's what we're created to do. We ask this in your name. Amen. Can we thank Olivia for her message? Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Uh, I always looked at that more ne- uh, negatively. You know, oh, if I do this, my heart's going to But also, you can look at it positively. It's that when we worship God, when we turn our attention toward God, our heart shifts that way. I love what Olivia was saying there about that, giving practical steps to turning our heart toward God. We're all in different places. But this invitation by Olivia to begin just certain ways to turn our hearts towards God, the invitation is there for you today. We allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you right now. Holy Spirit has been speaking already in certain ways, and we want to invite you to take a step there. Maybe you got to stay just for a moment and uh, just let the Holy Spirit kind of solidify what those next steps are. We also have Ben and Jane Lau here who would love to walk with you through what that could mean as we turn our hearts towards Jesus. Uh, So we want to invite you. If you just need a little prayer, need a little support, need someone in your corner, Ben and Jane are here. They've been praying before the service began in this auditorium for these moments right now. So we want to invite you to come, come down. Even if they're praying with someone, just sit right here, wait. Holy Spirit is always speaking, so even in the waiting, the Holy Spirit will be speaking to you, and so we just want to invite you to that. If you maybe are interested in turning toward the Lord, or at this moment, your heart kind of, hey, I want to begin following Jesus with my life. We would love to know that. You can go to our website, click on the Follow Jesus. You can come find me or find one of the staff here, find Olivia. Let us know. We want to hear your story. We want to partner with you, connect with you on what those next steps are. Next week, while we finish off our series, uh, Generous with the Good News, uh, gen- generous, uh, meaning good stewardship. I sure hope that is it. Is that, is that what it is? Oh, thank the Lord. I took a chance there, everyone. But uh, Pastor Rod will be back and sharing our final message. So we look forward to that. We also want to invite you. We have coffee and uh, community in the big room and in just in the lobby. We want to invite you to go in there, grab a coffee, grab a little snack, spend some time connecting with people as uh, we have a whole other second service coming too. So spend time greeting them and, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks for coming.